as we prepare to open the word of God today, and as we prepare to look at the different examples and points that are being presented, shall we seek his guidance and his direction so that we may more clearly understand that which we need for this time in earth's history. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for being so patient that you would allow your sinful creations to learn more of you. Today, Father, we need your guidance and we need your direction so that all that we study, all that we do, all of the appointments that we have today may be guided by you and directed by you. We thank you for this opportunity to join together. We thank you for this opportunity to come together where you will be also as your word is opened and as we seek to learn more of you. May your spirit guide us. May our minds be clear. Help us to understand. For this we pray. For this we thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so... Um... Just to let people know what we're looking at. So this is a chart that I, I worked out. It has the different tribes and it has numbers, the numbering of the children of Israel in numbers one to two. And so it has for each of the tribes. Of course, you see that Levi is not numbered. And, and then you can see the total. So after they have crossed, um, well, I guess, when did this numbering happen in Numbers chapter 1 and 2? So that's going to be – What does anybody have a date um, on well, that? <clears throat> aren't we looking at some time in the, in the second year after they've left Egypt? Yeah, it's in the second year, uh, the first day of the second month of the second year. Okay. So this is basically a year and, um, and a month. Well, it's not even a year and a month, so it's just the first day. So it's just basically over a year after they came out of Egypt. So um, so then uh, they're going to be numbered again in Numbers 26. So the new generation is going to be numbered. And again, this is 20 years old and upward. And, and those that are able to go to war. Now... When they do this, you know, one of the things that I've wondered about is why are the numbers rounded off in the way that they are? Okay. And, you know, you'd say, well, why, why are they in, mostly in just hundreds? There's the odd one that's in 50, and, um, and Reuben is 43730 in number 26. And there's 26, so it's 730. But would it have something to do with the way that they organize the military? That there must have been, um, because they would they would number them in 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 companies and etc. Right. So they would number them in groups. I wonder if that has something to do with it. Um, that there are some people they just would wouldn't be included because they're not going to be part of of the various groups. So there might be the odd person out. I don't know, but it's just. You know, because the question is, how do they actually do the numbering? And it could be just numbering of groups and putting them together to get the total. So, now, is this numbering just, is this numbering just the men? Yeah, 20 years old and upward. So this is for military service. That's what's being numbered. So maybe there's some arbitrary sense in which you can decide that somebody isn't really fit for war or somebody is, uh, or you just need to add some people to a number in a group. I don't know, but it, you know, it's just, to me, it's odd that it's not precise. So they're not counting each person individually, I would think. 
Yeah, so Iran says, um, numbered in 50s, that uh, the feeding of the 5,000 is numbered in 50s. And what, and the, and the hidden prophets? Um, I'm not sure what that means. <clears throat> Final reference for us. Okay. okay. So, so, you know, but, it's, mostly it's by hundreds, though, that we see here in these counts. But in this in this situation, in the way that the tribes are being listed, we also are seeing that this is by their encampment order. Right. So this is the order that they <laughs> march out. But the Levites aren't in this list because they're not numbered. So they would be in between Zebulun and Ephraim that they're going to march out. So 1 Kings 18, 14. 18, 4. 4, I mean, yeah. Um, and Ahab said, uh, you know, it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took in a hundred prophets and hid them by 50 in a cave and fed them with bread and water. So, yeah, so that's the division of 150. So there's two groups of 50 of these prophets that were hidden. Okay, thanks for that reference. Yeah, so, so you see significance in the fact that they're in this order. Um, what's... Dwight? So, well, the significance that I was looking at when you're when you look at the the camp order the camp of reuben would always be to the south yeah the camp of judah was to the east yeah now as as you noted in our conversation the levites would come following the camp of judah right then you would have the camp of ephraim which was to the west. Yeah. And the camp of Dan, which was to the north. Yeah. And, and we noted in when we were studying Ezekiel that this has to do with uh, the sky and the symbols that are there. So Reuben being uh, a man, which is Aquarius, Judah being Taurus, the bull, uh, Ephraim, which is. Um, an ox, and I can't remember, uh, that's, wait, yeah. so no, Taurus is the ox, uh, the lion is Jusha, um, so that's, uh, what's the lion constellation? Leo. Leo, that's it, there, yeah, I'm just getting these names mixed up, and then Dan is uh, the adder, or the snake, or the serpent, or uh, the eagle. So, so it has to do with the constellations, and then um, so Dan is going to follow at the back. His tribe is his section. So Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. Okay. Now on, on this chart, I have this differential between the numbering in numbers one to two and numbers 26. So that's how much uh, Reuben decreased, 2,770. Um, and Simeon decreased by 37,100. He went from 59,300 to 22,200 in one generation. And then some of the tribes increased, such as uh, the one that increased the most was Manasseh, from uh, increased 20,000, so from 32,200 to 52,700. 
And then I have the division of these numbers as days. So I, I just show them in years, and that's for convenience of figuring out spans of time, but also if any symbols arise in those. And then 360 days, which is mostly just for symbols. And then, and then the numbers 26 list, and you can see it's uh, 1,820 less in the second generation than the first generation. And then the divisions into days and then into uh, to 60 day years and 30 day months. And then finally, I take the division. And I didn't do it for the first ones, but I did for these ones. So I need to do that for uh, the numbers over here. But these are 20, these are lunar months and 30 day months. And so we got these uh, divisions of those as spans of days. <clears throat> yeah, so judges over people in groups, that's Exodus 18.21. Uh, Iran is noting there. And moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. But for whatever reason, the, the numbering is generally in the hundreds. So it's, it's either rounded up or down, or those are just, it's calculated based upon uh, the number of leaders with the certain number of groups underneath them as a way of counting it. So we just don't know how they went about doing their census, but it seems to me that they would have put them in groups and then counted the groups. And that would be the easiest way to do it. It's like when you're counting money, you know, you put them all into groups and then count the groups. So, so the one thing which um, which I'm going to go over on Friday night, but just dealing with uh, here, so I'm going to just show you what the numbers produce because I haven't finished this yet, um, and not everybody's going to be able to see this really well. Uh, but this is over here. I've just taken uh, the count that uh, for Zebulun, this is July 18th here, counting back from July 18th. Um, this is Odilio's study, and he put May 23rd, 1863, and this is uh, the last day of the general conference session in 1863 in which the church organized. And sometimes you'll see that that's given as the official date the Seventh-day Adventist church organized is May 23rd, 1863, though technically it was on May 21st, but SDA uh, encyclopedia says May 23rd because they're looking at the last day of the conference. And we had Zebulun and Naphtali in Judges chapter 4 being paired together because they're going to be uh, connected with this um, uh, the group that Barak has. Uh, so they're going to join in that. And you can see here that I took the number of Naphtali which happens to be 1,780 prophetic months, that period of time, 53,400 days. And this brings us to the year 1980, which is the year in which the falling of the stars occurs. Um, so, so that's just another way of using this span. Um, but the one that's pretty significant, which I figured out since the meeting yesterday, well, right after the meeting, is we were looking at August 29th, Parminder's Rebellion. And we noticed that if we took Reuben, because we were talking about Reuben, Reuben symbolizes a man and man's understanding. And his number is 46,500 days. So we took one hundredth of that. 
and we counted from Parminder's Rebellion to the Declaration of December 6, 2020, which we see these two as connected. And Bronwyn is involved in both of these. So this is a, a fraction of this span of time. But with um, Odilio's study on May 23rd, 1863, the last day of the General Conference in 1863, the next, next significant General Conference would be the 1888 General Conference. And we know that these are already connected, 1863 and 1888, this period of 25 years, and they connect to Parminder's prediction of 2014. Um, which he did in 2012, dealing with the Sunday Law. But if we count from the last day of the General Conference, just as we do here, November 4th, 1888, it's 60, 46,500 days, so that's the numbers of the tribes of Reuben, to Parminder's ordination on February 26th, 2016. So either this is just some kind of odd coincidence or it's significant that we can connect these two periods with 465 days, or these two events, and these two events with 46,500 days coming from Reuben. Any thoughts on that? Well, so I'll make this, this one a little bigger. there's a lot that you're placing in this that is going to have to be examined and examined quite fully. Yeah. Now, yeah. I mean, I guess it's just that I'm, I'm still looking at, at some of the basic items regarding this with the arrangements of the camp and everything else, because so much of, of what we've got here can also interrelate not only with the, the name of the camp itself, like we were saying, Reuben, Judah, Ephraim, and Dan, mm -hmm. but the composition of the camp. Because in the composition of the camp, as, as you were pointing it out, you have Reuben, Simeon, and Gad in the, in the camp of Reuben. Yeah. So you have the first two sons of Leah, and you have one of the sons of a handmaid. Then you've got the next three are all sons of Leah, but we're dealing with, with the fourth, eighth, and ninth sons of Leah <clears throat> in Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The, tr the camp of Ephraim are all Raquel's children because they are of Joseph and they are of Benjamin. Mm -hmm. And then the final camp, the one to the north, are strictly of the handmaids, two of Raquel and one of Leah. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at this in birth order, <clears throat> you've got one, two, and six for the for the first group. That's one, two, and five, isn't it? No, six. Uh, one, is, one, two, and seven. <clears throat> what? Yad is the seventh. Right? One, two, and seven. I show Gad is the sixth. Because I have Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad. That's what I have listed. Okay, that's, that's why we have an issue. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. Dan would be the fifth. And is not in, now. In Genesis, because... Because they give them that order. In what book should we be looking at? 
in general. Starting on Genesis. Starting on Genesis, what? 29. Can you hear? You're coming in, you're breaking up. You're very sporadic. Are you there? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. <clears throat> Your video is starting to come through, but you have low bandwidth. Your picture is now frozen. <clears throat> Just let it fix itself. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So there you have the verses on the right. And you have the names on the left, and my guess at which year they're born, and the meanings of their names and the mother. Okay, so you're saying Okay, so you've got Gad then is seven. So we'll apply it that way. Yeah, well the Bible has it that way. Right. Okay. So, and then Judah is the fourth. Issachar is what? Um, the ninth. Ninth. Zebulun is? The tenth. So, if we look at this and we're multiplying these out, the first camp would multiply one by two by seven would give us 14 as an answer, right? Mm -hmm. The second, four by nine by 10 would give us 360. Yeah. Right? Now, Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin. How would we approach that? Well, I mean, Ephraim, Manasseh are both of the, the 10th, or I mean, the, uh, the, the 11th, and Benjamin's the 12th. Of the sons. Of the sons. So I don't okay. know how you, would, how you would count Manasseh and, and Ephraim. Okay. I mean, if we if we counted them as as one item, then the result we would have would be one thirty two. If we square 11, we would be looking at 1452. Yeah. Uh, if you squared 11? You square 11 and then you also multiply by 12. Okay, I see what you're saying. And uh, then Dan. So by square 11, I get. 132. Okay. Yeah, okay. Multiply that by 12. Okay, so I'm not doing this right. So 11 times 11, I get 121 times 12. You're adding, aren't you? Am I, or am I wrong? Yeah, yeah, I think you're wrong. Because 11 squared is 121. You're right. Excuse me. So it's 14, 1452. That's right. what I said. Okay. Yeah, I know. But you. <laughs> okay. I made the mistake. I was just trying to multiply 132 times 12, and I kept Got it. Okay. 
<laughs> All right. Yeah. And then the, the birth order for Dan, Asher, and Naphtali would be what? Yeah, so um, five, six, and eight. So if we look at that, 240. Okay. I don't know if there's anything there or not. I don't know. But I think right now, as far as in the context of dealing with the numbering of the children of Israel, uh, the interesting thing is that we can use these as periods of time. Okay. And so we've shown that. Now, I, I just need to work on what period of time each of these uh, tribes are representing. And I, and I think it's interesting that there's these differences between, you know, numbers chapter 1 and 2 and numbers 26, because these also can be spans of time. You know, for instance, if you look at Asher, um, the difference is 11,900. So that's a difference of uh, that period of time um, that's 32 years and seven months. That's the difference there, which if anybody remembers that, that that's the... Um, the difference between the lunar calendar and the solar calendar. That's where they. That's when the Islamic calendar lines up again with the, um, the seasons. And if you have twelve of those periods, that's three hundred and ninety-one years, uh, both on the solar and the biblical calendar. So, so that that's kind of interesting that we have that number somebody can say well it's just uh, a coincidence but um, you know there must be something like even just looking at these numbers in connection with how they're set out in the tribes we haven't done that but we can combine these things together um, so I don't I don't know specifically So we we'll have to examine. Right. There's a lot to examine. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this would interrelate then with the with the periods that we're seeing that have been occurring. So it's giving further support to the idea that Judges 2 is giving us a framework for the time period of this movement. Well, it ties our movement to Millerite history. Right. That's that's what we've done at this point. It's been able to tie those those histories together. And you know, there may be more uses that we can do with it, but specifically to Judges chapter four. So, I mean, I'm going to have to visit this in a lot more detail as we go on. But in Judges chapter four, we have, uh, as I noted, we have um, Zebulun and Naphtali connected together. So these are going to be 10,000 men of Zebulun and Naphtali. Right. So, so if we look at this list here, so this is going to be after they count the people the second time. So this is going to be Numbers 26. Okay. And then in Numbers 26, if we look at the number of Naphtali, that's 45,400. 
and Zebulun is 60,500. Well, you can see that that number is over uh, 10,000. They're both over 10,000. Um, oh, pardon me. Yeah. Yeah. It's over 100,000, pardon me. Right? Correct. So they're not taking all of these men, right? So they're basically one tenth of these men uh, to go in, in this fight. So he calls from Zebulun and Naphtali about one tenth, which is a remnant. Okay. And actually, this number, if you add it together, um, it's a hundred thousand and um, five hundred or nine. What is it? It's a hundred and five thousand nine hundred. Yeah, a hundred and five thousand nine hundred. No, it's a hundred, hundred and nine thousand. Uh, no. Because I'm looking at. Okay, where are you looking? Numbers twenty six. Okay, so we got Zebulun. Okay, right, sixty thousand five hundred. Okay, I was looking at the wrong one. So yeah, so it's one hundred and five thousand nine hundred. So so anyway, it's it's about a, It's just under a tenth that he's taking of these of these two tribes. So I mean, he could have got a lot more. But for this battle, he's only taking 10,000. Of course, they're being oppressed. So I don't know how difficult it is to, to go to war in this situation. So the way that we're looking at this is that the, there's 10,000 total out of Zebulun and Naphtali, not 10,000 out of each tribe. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's 10,000 men who go after him or follow after him. And they're out of these two tribes. Okay. Now, it's interesting that 10,000 is not being taken from Judah. And that we have this coming from a tribe where we have Zebulun, which was of Leah, and Naphtali, <clears throat> which was of the handmaiden, but also technically Leah. Yeah. Right. And, and of course, it's where this um, oppression is occurring, because this oppression is occurring up in the north. Um, in that in that territory, but they're not calling all Israel together. And it may be that, you know, the kingdom's not really completely united at this point. And we had one was in, you know, we had the, uh, the different oppressions are in different parts of Israel. So this is in the area of Mount Tabor. So do we apply this as a, an early inference of the King of the North coming against God's people? Okay, so the way that we looked at this is that this is representative um, of um uh, so when ehud was dead you're going to have um jabin so jabin is going to represent the papacy and right. Sisera is the general right so this is the king of the north but sisera is is the general and we're saying that this is representing a message that is parallel to the message of the papacy, but coming into this movement. So Arminder's, Arminder's message is, is really papal. My question, my thought process, since there are two Jabins, 
Yeah. One, one that Joshua defeated, right? Yep. Or was that, or was he defeated by Moses? Um, that was Joshua, I believe. Okay. So we have the two Jabins. One that's being defeated by Joshua. One that comes up during the time. Do these, yeah. do these two Jabins represent pagan Rome first and papal Rome second? That's an idea, but, you know, what we have to look at, because we're making an application, so as we said before, this is a special application of taking these histories and, and placing them in the history of this movement, and that's because of Judges chapter 2. So that means we don't really have pagan Rome in our history. We have papal Rome. But we could refer it back to the way that I would look at it more is that you have Millerite history and the repeat of Millerite history. So in both cases, I think it would be Papal Rome. Whether a larger application can be made to represent this bigger portion of time, but we would look at judges as being Millerite history. Uh, if we're taking, or not judges, Joshua, if we're taking judges here as our movement. So it's a special application to our movement. So I know I know it, it, there's the tempting thing to sort of put it in a broader broader framework. But I think we have to look at it just in the narrow sense of this movement. Um, and so what we see with, with Parminder is he's bringing in papal teaching into this movement, a type of papal philosophy on how he's studying. He's bringing in spiritualistic ideas. He's bringing in the wokeism of the world. I mean, they're telling us that we shouldn't even really be critical of the papacy. In some ways, they see the enemy as being Adventism itself. Adventism, you know, the idea of keeping the Sabbath was a mistake. Those types of things. So, so this is a message that is introducing papal doctrine into this movement. And we, we have addressed these 20 years um, as a period of 20 years, but it's also can be referred to as a period of 20 months. Right, so we, so we applied it in two different ways, 20 years and 20 months. Okay. Um, and both of them are going to give witness to Parminder and his movement. So, I mean, I think that's where we sort of have to stick with this. Right, because we did... Uh, the 20 years, and the 20 years um, is going to go from you know, 2001 to 2021. All right. And then the 20 months is going to be that period um, dealing with um, uh, that symbolic date, right? The, after 200 months, it's the 20 months symbolically from January 15th, 2018 to September 7th, 2019, and also uh, January 15th, 2018 to August 29th, 2019. So those are, if we start on January 15th, which is started, started the 200th month from September 11th, then you have these 20 months in both prophetic and lunar 
months that bring us to these two different dates in our history. And so, so to me, the, the, I mean, and the 20 prophetic years actually goes from uh, September 11th, 2001 to May 29th, 2021. So why would it be why would it be that shortened? Well, there's 105 days then to September 11th. Right. So those are 20 prophetic years that brings us to that symbol. So there's there's symbols tied up with it. But I'm you know we're going to go through this again in the future. But the point is, in in what we're trying to explain here is that this is talking about Parminder's movement and its effect upon this movement. So because we have to divorce from the strange wives. And so Parminder's teaching has still infected this movement even today, right? So trying to address that, that's part of what these studies are doing. All right. Now the 10,000 men we could take as a period of time. So where did we place the 10,000 days? I don't recall. So that went from uh, November 9th, 1989 to March 27th, 20, uh, 2017, I believe. So that, that brought us into um, a symbolic date that's connected. It's 781 days inclusive from the end of the Mayan calendar there, when the world was supposed to end. So it has that symbol of July 18th in reverse, 18, 7, 7, 8, 1. And it's also connected to that structural chiasm. So it brings us into our history, that 10,000 days. If, if we're going to count it from November 9th, uh, 1989. All right. So, so again, all of these symbols are symbols that we can use in this movement. And, and so that's where we got to. With the 10,000, it can represent days. We can see that these tribes, the numbering of these tribes can represent days. And um, so to me, those are the primary symbols that we have if we're going to look, if we're going to deal with the numbering right now and, and what tribes are involved that it's, it's specifically pointing to a message that's going to um, deliver us from Parminder, if you want to put it that way. But there's still more to go because we haven't dealt with JL yet. Right. So we have, do we deal just with JL or do we deal with Heber and JL? Well, Heber and JL. So we did address Heber already. And, and my understanding is this refers to um, um, a certain part of this message. So, so there's still more I guess we have to look at. But the point that, that I looked at was this tent and, and other symbols connected with this, this history. Right. So this pointed to a message coming from me. Right. So it had to do with the message that I was presenting. If you remember all the details, I don't. <laughs> I'm not recalling all of the details, so. Well, I know the tent. So when, when you talked about the tent, I looked at the word tent. And that word tent is the Hebrew number 168. And I know that 77 times 168 is my home address. 
right? So when I when I was a child. And then he's going to pitch it in the plane of Za'anaim, right? And, and this becomes a symbol as well. So, okay. Um, so Za'anaim is 65 in Gematria, and that was my, my street. So I had my home address, 12936, 65th Street. So Zanam is 65 in Gematria. All right. So so to me, it represents my home because it's talking about his home. He pitched his tent in the plain of Zanam. And that's my address. That's the way that I look at it. So so this is a message that that's pointing to the message that I gave. All right. And I mean, there was other things I can't remember. There were some other things when we looked at this. Um, I think part of it was looking at um, um, the, the, the Sabbath morning study dealing with um, the guy who buried the gold and the silver in his tent. Aiken. Aiken, yeah. So, so, so there we have a tent as well, but we also have uh, the symbol of, of there of gold and silver and the Babylonian garment, right? Right. So a goodly Babylonian garment. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to remember the gematria of all this. That was 264. So that's a symbol of the 26th day of the fourth month, which is a symbol of July 18th, right? And then we had um, uh, silver. So the gematria for silver in the reverse sum is 77. And so 77 times 168. So he has this silver in his tent. And if you multiply 77 by 168, you get my home address, 12936. So again, it's showing that there is this rebellion or this message um, is being addressed in this tent, right, or by this tent. So there's something about this that we, um, that it's, Basically, I would see, you know, if Heber's, you know, he's not representing me, but he's representing the message that I'm giving, which is going to be connected with the overthrow of Sisera. But, you know, he's a pretty minor player here in this story. And then we also have Kedesh as well, which is a symbol of the sanctuary, the holy place. This is a Naphtali, Kadesh of Naphtali. And then we had started on, you know, they showed Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, was gone up to Mount Tabor. And you asked the question about who's the, the they. And, and we don't really know, but it just seems people who saw what was happening uh, directed Sisera to where Barak was. So, so that's where we were yesterday. Anyway, I'm going to stop my share so you can share your screen. Okay. So I think we can bring this all together once we get all the pieces. But, but you can see where we're going. I mean, and, and it seemed to me pretty clear right from the beginning. We just keep getting more and more evidence for it. Okay. So as we as we continue with this as we are returning to judges 4 we were looking at this yesterday and Deborah said unto Barak up for this 
is the day which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand? Is not the long is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor, and ten thousand men after him. So, in this situation, Barak is being reminded that the Lord is in charge, and that Sisera as we're making this application, would be as Parminder, right? Yeah. So does that, is that then that the message of Barak, the message of chronology, is what is going to be used by the Lord in the defeat of Sisera. Mm -hmm. Was that a, a, a correct application? Yeah. Well, for instance, uh, Judges 4.15, the Lord discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled on his feet. Um, the combined... Uh, that is, if we take the sum of this verse, gematria of this verse, uh, and the reverse sum, and we combine them, we get 3915. So that's the 391.5. Which is August 11th, 1840. Right. It's the, the message period. of, yeah. The, it, it's a message of the validity of the prophetic interpretation of scripture. Yeah. So for our time, this is a message of the validity of the application of chronology with the prophetic applica applications of scripture. Yeah. And then when Jael, Heber's wife, takes this nail of the tent. But we haven't gotten there yet. I know, but I'm just saying the differential in that verse is 777. Okay. So, so, um, so that's the differential, but the other one's the addition of it. I'm just saying that we can look at these and we can see that um, these are these are tying together these numbers. Uh, Gematria in English for Heber. Well, it's pretty easy to do. You just add them together. No, I wanted to know what what whether that verse was 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 the gematria in English or Hebrew. Sorry, I abbreviate a lot. Okay. But this is English gematria, King James. Okay. Thanks. Okay. But Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host. Unto, unto Heresheth of the Gentiles. And all the host of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. So the battle is lost. Sisera is on foot. Barak chooses to pursue after the chariots and after the host. And all of the host of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword. Now, is this a Hebraism for that they were slain, or is this a Hebraism for that they committed suicide? Okay, I mean, I would normally think it's just that they were slain. Because I'm, I'm sitting here thinking of this like Saul, when Saul understood that the battle was lost. Yeah, I don't think, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's different though. All right. Um, 
Yeah, because it's it's just the King James translation here. Okay. Yeah, it should be Sisera fell by the edge of the sword, not upon the edge of the sword. Okay. okay. Not sure why they put upon. Okay, now the next verse gives us the introduction of Jael. But we're we're being asked this as a question. How be it Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite? For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. Why does this verse begin with how be it? To me, that's a question. Yeah, um, no, it wouldn't be, how be it is not a question. It just means uh, how something happened, how it occurred. It's not a question word. It's just another way of saying that is, or came to pass, or things like that. Um, and, and they're just they're just adding adding this in English. There's nothing here in Hebrew other than a vav that they're translating as how be it. Okay. So Sisera is on foot, and he comes to the one tent that his master, J.L., is at peace with. Would that be a fair statement? Um, so, so he comes to Heber's, the wife of Heber's tent. And, the, and they're basically at peace with each other. Right. I mean, right. if he came to J.L.'s tent, the wife of Heber's tent, it's the same thing as Heber's tent, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Well, it is or it isn't. Well, it is. Yes. I just It just doesn't say Heber's tent. It says J.L., the wife of Heber's tent. The tent of J.L., the wife of Heber. That's all I'm saying. Okay. To me, that's that's important, right? Right. Because Heber's tent, I mean, this is his home, right? But before it's referred to as his tent. So again, this is a symbol for me of my my home address. Okay. So then we need to figure out who JL is as far as a message. What does that mean? Well, since we have L at the end. The first portion would then reference it that is something of God, right? Uh, not necessarily. This is just a wild goat. Okay. So it doesn't have the L doesn't have anything to do with God here. It's just. Uh, but wasn't it in the sanctuary? Wasn't there one goat that was the. Uh, and one for Zazzle, yeah. Right. Yeah, there is. Okay. But that doesn't apply here. Yeah, this is a, like a mountain goat. Okay. This isn't a, a goat for the sanctuary. So JL is seen, is being defined as as a goat a mountain goat and heber is what um well it's a comrade um companion also represents a community okay so sisera has come to the tent Wherein is JL, the wife of Hebrew? Mm -hmm. And Sisera's master is at peace with the house of Hebrew, the Kenite. And JL went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not, 
And when he had turned into her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle or rug or blanket. Yeah. Now, when I was looking at this in the spirit of prophecy, Jael didn't understand who Sisera was. So she's going to hide him. Not, so she, knowing, not knowing who he is, she's going to hide him. And he said unto her, give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. Why milk instead of water? Maybe that's what she had. I don't know. But is this a symbol you mean? Right. Well, I think this would be the sincere milk of the word. The first principles of the oracle of God. The basic principles of the gospel. Okay, so it's the basic principles of the gospel rather than the water of life. Yeah, in this context. So then as we continue, and he said unto her, stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be when any man doth come and inquire of thee and say, is there any man here, thou shalt say no. So he's instructing her not to tell the truth. Right. He's, he's instructing her to send people away. Mm -hmm. He's being duplicitous. Yeah. Why is he prevaricating so? What symbol do we take from this? Yeah, so one thing, you know, Ellen White says that J.L. was uh, first ignorant of the character of his guests, and she resolved to conceal him. But when she afterward learned that he was Sisera, the enemy of God and his people, her purpose changed. So it doesn't tell us this specifically in the Bible, though. I mean, right, right it's not telling us this. She hides him, but... But then she discovers his character. And this happened in this movement, didn't it? Well, exactly. Here's, here's the thing. Yeah. He's telling her to lie. So does that not reveal his character? Yes. So how she comes to figure out who he is exactly, I don't know. But she's going to figure this out. So as a symbol. So if we go back and we look at these symbols. So we... We can look at Sisera as being Parminder's message, right? Now, J.L., the wife of Heber, well, wouldn't this be a church or a movement? It would have to be. And this is the movement that is going to be in this tent or this home of Heber. Right? So those people who are studying the chronology and understanding July 18th, that would be represented by JL. But at first, we're not, we're not aware of Parminder's character, right? Even Stephen, um, up until August 29th, or, you know, he thought that Parminder was going to accept uh, the message of July 18th. So this would represent, JL would represent this part of this movement that's accepting July 18th. Would that make sense? I think it's making a point. Now, also, this idea that, that Heber is at peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor. 
So there's peace between these two houses. And, and we're saying that Jabin represents the papacy in this movement, right? Okay. That is, and, and we can see that there was peace. That is, when Parminder was presenting, I wasn't at anima, you know, I wasn't um, at animosity with Parminder. I was actually submissive to Parminder. It's going to take time for us to figure out Parminder's uh, methods, where he's coming from. And, and I think that's what's being illustrated here. That you have this group of people that's sympathetic in some ways to Jabin. And, and obviously to Sisera. But then they discover Sisera's character. And then they and and this movement then is going to put this nail in in the temples of Sisera while he sleeps. So we would have to determine what this nail is and what the hammer is. But you know, she goes softly unto him. This isn't uh, an all out attack against uh, a message. It's something that's done um, because they start to understand the character of Cicero. And so to me, this would characterize how the message of July 18 came in. It didn't come as an antagonistic message to Parminder and to his movement. It was actually trying to be supportive of Parminder and what he was doing, what he was teaching. July 18th was to be a supplementary or complementary uh, to November 9th, 2019. All right, but it wasn't complimentary to what was going on. No, but it was meant to be, right? I mean, everything that I was doing, even, even if we go back earlier on, the prediction before midnight, I tend to be a, a peacemaker, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not a person who wants to be antagonistic towards others. So I look at the message and I try to to understand uh, the things that people are teaching that are true. I could recognize that there were saying some things I didn't like. I mean, I understood what, what they were doing with organization wasn't from God, but I, I believed that they were going to sort this out because this was God's movement. But as time went on, I wasn't the one that caused the division. The division was caused because they were teaching error and and I was continuing to stick to truth. But if they could have accepted the truth, it could have protected them from the error. But the thing is they didn't want to leave the error because the error was the thing they were interested in. They only used truth as a cloak. They weren't interested in truth. But there was truth there. Just it was also error. Okay. Now, from the chat, comment was that uh, Je Elder Jeff's epiphany on Paraminder's character was first revealed on September 7th of 2019. Right. And so we have that in the lines. So would we also see this symbolically as being the ninth day of the seventh month? Um, and the application I'm making there, the last day of the Feast of Trumpets, just before the beginning of the Day of Atonement. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think so. I don't, we've never made that application. Uh, there's other ways that we, we apply it. Um, I don't think that makes sense. Okay. 
Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. Is this representational of the rejection of the leadership of Parmenter within the movement? Yep. And it's because of the nail of the tent. And we also have an, a hammer here, too. But, okay, within this, how do we view the woman, JL, as putting, as doing this with Parmender? What, what application do we make? Well, it's the understanding of July 18th. Okay. The way in which it was done, the way in which it was presented. That is, we didn't present a message that was, um, you know, an attacking message. Like, it was softly. I mean, we knew in the end that it was putting a nail in the temples of Parminder, his message. July 23, 29. But, but this was just... The result of this was um, not, it wasn't, it wasn't until we saw his character that, that this happened, right? So, I mean, to me, this characterizes the way in which July 18th was presented. That's, you know, my, my understanding of it. Some of the things he said was just plain black and white, like no Sunday law and yeah, but but that you know, kind of wasn't thing. necessarily even after the no Sunday law, I was still defending this. Um, and <clears throat> there was even in some <clears throat> of this, you know, we weren't opposed to Parminder, but but it says here when Jail Heber's wife took this nail as a tent, if we look at the gematria of that verse on Iran's uh, gematria Bible, um, the Bible numbery thing, whatever it's called, um, the differential between uh, the sum of the verse, the reverse sum and the forward sum is 777. And we can see that that, that message of the 777 structure, which was never accepted by Parminder, was an undoing of Parminder. And Parminder had a chance, the move, that movement had a chance to accept the milk, but they rejected it. Well, I mean, it didn't benefit them, right? Because he's still going to be um, deceptive. Right, so he was, receives the milk, but then he still is duplicitous. Okay. So then Jail's going to take this nail of the tent. This nail of the tent has to do with this whole structure. Um and put it into the temples of Sisera or Parminder's message. And, and that's gonna be the end of Parminder's message. Okay. The end of Parminder's message or is it just the end of the application? Well, Parminder's message comes to an end. Um, and it, in verse 23, so God subdued on that day, Jabin the king of Canaan before the children of Israel. Well, 23, we can say represents 2023, which is where the end of our line comes to. And 
the combined sum of those that that um, verse is 1782, which has all of the the symbols of July 18, 2020, the one seven, the one the 78 to two in there. Okay, but with this application, yeah. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said unto him, Come, I will show thee the man whom thou seekest. And when he came into her tent, behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temples. So how are we applying this verse with 2022? With the year 2022, you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Well, this is this is the time that we're in. Right? So this is actually what's been happening. Because this message regarding July 18th and all these numbers and all these things have, have, are actually bringing an end to Parminder's message. Now, Parminder's message still exists in this movement. Right, we agree with that. I'm not disagreeing with it. Yeah, because we know that people in this movement are actually still taking the position of Parminder regarding chronology and the same position that was taken on December 6, 2020. And but it's that message that's going to be victorious in the end. So this movement this part of this movement that we're going to call JL, because this is a woman. It's not necessarily a message, it's a movement. Um, is going is what's going to bring an end to this message of Parminder's, its influence over this movement. So, in other words, the movement is in covenant with Hebrew. The movement is in covenant, or it should be in covenant, with the companion. Yeah. Would that be a fair statement? Yeah. And, 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 and it's, it's, it should be in unity, right? That's the whole idea, community. That's what Heber means. Yeah, community. I understood that. Yeah. And, and, and Barak, of course, is this message of chronology, but it's still going to be the message that of JL, of the movement Together United, that's going to defeat Parminder. So we have Barak, we have Deborah, we have Heber, we have JL. They all represent aspects of this movement. And, and we say, to me, Deborah represented the movement prior to July 18th, because Barack is not going to move without Deborah. Right? That is, we're not going to move without FFA. We're not going to present July 18th unless FFA is going to support it. But then after July 18th, we're going to have this message of um, that's represented by Heber and JL. Okay. So since this since this chapter ends. 424, and the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin the king of Canaan until they had destroyed Jabin the king of Canaan. Right. So from 24 till whenever, this is uh, this destruction of this. this uh, so the destruction occurs. 2023 and 2024. 
Well, it actually, in, in our line, because it's going to be the divorce, the divorce occurs from 23 to 2030, right? Because it ends on the first day of the first month. So there's still a battle against Jabin, king of Canaan. Right. Until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan, which in, in the line symbolizes 2030. But like the alternate reading would, would show us, and the hand of the children of Israel going went and was hard and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, the king of Canaan. So this destruction is to come upon the portion of the Catholic message that has been within the movement? Well, the false system of study, yes. Okay. And now, um, this alternate reading, you may not understand the significance of this. I don't. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so in the Hebrew, um, so they got prevailed, and they got two words, halak and kasha. So, so that I, I don't know why uh, going went against i'm not sure here let me just look uh here um so so this idea of halak means to walk but it means lots of different things figuratively um but that's how the, it starts and to walk uh the hand um um, the son of Israel. So that's what it says, to walk the hand. The son of Israel, or the sons of Israel. Um, and then it says to walk again. Right? So you don't see that in, when it says the hand of the children of Israel prospered, uh, that word prospered um, is, uh, what's the number they have here? Yeah, so they're going to have that to walk. So that's actually the first word in the verse. To walk the hand of the children of Israel. To walk um, hard against Jabin. Is if, if you're just going to translate it literally. King of Canaan. So, the, so there's kind of a doubling here. But to walk the hand of the children of Israel, uh, to walk hard, grievous, cruel, um, um, against the, the king of Jabin, or Jabin king, king of Canaan. And... Yeah, so until they had destroyed, I'm just looking at this, to consume, to cut off Jabin, the king of Canaan. Okay. So it's just kind of weird uh, to walk, to walk hard against Jabin. To walk hard against Jabin. Yeah. But it says to walk the hand of the children of Israel to walk hard. That, that's literally what it would translate at. It's kind of a, a strange. Um, now they have, you know, the hand of the children of Israel goeth, going on and becoming hard. But the goeth is the walking. Right. So, so they're going to continue to go until they consume the king of Canaan. And so that means this is something that is continuing on 
even after this. Okay. Right, so this is where their battle is. From even though it's before, they're still fighting against Javan. It's not something that ended. Even though they defeat him, there's still this battle going on. That's the idea that I get from the Hebrew. Is part of this defeat, defeating the use of the um, <clears throat> spiritual formation? Well, I think it's the papers here. I mean, that's the thing that really Parminder brought in. Besides the system of Bible study, um, this is something that we have to battle against. And really, the papal spirit is just self. Okay. Right. I mean, the real problem that we have in this movement that we've had for a long time is how we deal with what we perceive as being error. And, and people that we think are in error. That is, we haven't followed the counsels that Ellen White has given. That is, some person may decide something's error, and he decides it for other people. And since other people themselves don't figure it out, they can easily be deceived by that error. Okay. You know, so it's fine for Jeff to recognize that something that somebody's teaching is error. But those people also have to know that themselves by experience, by understanding. The church can't protect us from error, for instance. They always think that they're going to protect the members from error because the pastors know better. And so something comes along that they perceive to be error, they shut it down. But that actually doesn't stop error from growing. Often it promotes it. Because, you know, people are going to be mistreated by the, by the conference. So you have, you know, lunar, uh, lunar Sabbatarians or you have feast keepers or name of God people or whatever it is. Um, they come into your church. They get shut down. But they've already developed sympathizers. And what the church should do is look at those things openly, not in a... In a uh, you know, in a polemical manner, not having speakers come in and speak against this supposed error, because you don't know, one, whether something is truth or error, because you haven't examined it, you don't even know what necessarily people are teaching. But also the people who are associated with those people teaching that error aren't going to be convinced because often what, what is the error is even being misrepresented. And anybody can see that if they take the time to look at it. So so this movement, the reason why these enemies have continued in this movement is because we never followed the council on how to deal with error. You know, first there is the laboring with the individual. But there's also, you have to give the individual a hearing. That is, you have to look at it honestly, and everybody has to look at it. You can't just have the leadership look at what somebody's teaching and decide that it's error and then shut that person um, out and align their characters. Okay. Now, as we are coming to the close of our time together today, one comment from the chat. Uh, Jabin is noted as being the king of Canaan, but he reigns in Hazor. Mm -hmm. So the question was asked, is there significance of Jabin king of Hazor being changed to Jabin king of Canaan? I don't see that there was ever a change from king of Canaan to king of Hazor. I see that the king of Canaan reigned in Hazor. To me, that's no different than saying the king of Italy reigns from Rome. Yeah, or the king of the United States reigns from uh, uh, Washington, D.C. 
or Hollywood, whichever it is. Right. So I'm not I'm not really seeing a difference there. Now, are there any other questions or comments with what we've been covering here from Judges 4? Well, we still have a lot of loose ends to tie up. Yes, we do. And we'll have to return to these on Sunday. Mm -hmm. and, and then we're going to have the Song of Deborah and Barak, which is going to give us a review of this history. Right. Um, it's going to give us more details about uh, the message, actually. Okay. Okay. So are there any other comments at this point? Any other questions? Okay. Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've spent today. We thank you for the many symbols that you are presenting, for the opportunity that we have to come together, to puzzle these things out, to consider what is contained within your word. Direct us this day. Be with us in all of our appointments. Be with us in all of our meetings. May your will be done. May your guidance be clear in our minds, our sinful minds, so that we might be able to draw closer to you. Please forgive us of our sins, direct us now, and bring us back together again, if this be your will. For this we praise you, and this we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.